On the corner of Ogant and Tuppelhocken, a three-story building stands tall, overlooking the area it calls home, watching cars and people walk by on a regular basis. It has stood tall for scores of years, but for the past four decades, it's been more than just a building. The seats you see here provided rest for a countless number of believers. If these walls could talk, you would hear shouts of hallelujah. Some like to affectionately call it the room. However, if you tried to say that around a steadfast member, they would politely correct you by saying the official name is Upper Room Missionary Baptist Church. Children have grown into men and women of faith here. Couples joined in holy matrimony. Others requested their last physical appearance on earth be in this place. More importantly, an immeasurable amount of lives were saved and brought to Christ here. Whatever the case, it's a religious institution that nearly everyone who walked through these doors calls home. But to fully understand Upper Room's importance, one must look at Upper Room's beginnings. That undoubtedly starts with the church's founder, the late Bishop Joseph C. Aiken Sr. He was very impressionable, so, you know, the impression that he would leave, he was really straightforward. So everybody would always start off and say, I remember your father came and said this to me, and, you know, it always stuck with me. I would say, I think he had a desire to, sh to share what he had with us. He was a good conversationist, uh, to be able to talk to people, engage them. To me, he was just so, just larger than life. Really funny, great personality. Uh, a man of faith, great faith. It didn't take anything from him, just step out on faith. The vision of starting this church came to him after delivering the word at a church in Washington, D.C. My husband and I were there for um, a service. He had to do a service for um, Upper Room Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. That was when he had the vision of a church with that name. And when we came out, we were on our way home, and he said, you know, uh, when God calls me to start a church, I'm going to name it Upper Room Baptist Church. At that time, Bishop Aiken was approaching his eighth year as pastor of New Salem Baptist Church. But once it became clear what God wanted him to do, it was time to take action. We were at New Salem about seven and a half years, and um, the Lord began to speak to him about um, starting a church. And the more um, he talked, about it, the more it became real. He had some ideas about what he wanted to do and did uh, that wouldn't go mesh. And uh, I mean, he loved them, uh, you know, Kevin would have done anything for him and anything like that. But for him, it was better for him to, to move outside, in which he did. He began to talk to some of the members and telling them that he was, which were the members that he that had come with him uh, as he pastored New Salem, and they were ready to follow him wherever he wanted to go. And some of them said, listen, wherever you go, we're going to go with you. After turning in his resignation, Bishop Aiken, First Lady Jane Aiken, and 29 members of New Salem left to form a new church. Their first meeting was at the Quaker Friends Home in North Philadelphia. We were um, just excited and eager to get started. We knew that we were there to organize a church. We all had a set mind that we were going to be about something and about a plan that was great. And God had a vision for us through our pastor. We all was excited. I was excited for the new move. I was excited because I wanted to know what, what was going to happen, where we was going, and how we were going to begin it. So I was excited about it. 
I think there was something that he believed that the Lord wanted him to do, even though he wasn't fully aware of what it is. But he would move in that direction and catch it along the way. After that meeting, a recognition service was held at Mount Sinai Baptist Church. The pastor, Reverend Joseph Fuller Jr., was a longtime friend and confidant of Bishop Aiken. I think I was called to help him because some things I was able to get through Joe and some things I wasn't able to get through. But we maintained a relationship. He thought he could trust me and he valued my opinion. Bishop Aiken preached an exhilarating sermon that day from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, verse 6. So build ye the wall, for the people had a mind to work. After uh, gathering the 29 people that he had, he began to look for a building. Uh, so he was excited about that, and uh, he did find a building, uh, a 2948 Germantown Avenue, and uh, that's where we went. As time went on, we moved, and <laughs> Bishop said, I have a place, a building. And we all said, where? He said, the 72nd at Ogans. This was a, 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 a pornographic movie. And uh, that he was saying that, I think we deserve better than this. And to have this kind of stuff in the, the heart of the area that uh, actually do something with this. In spite of what it used to be, it was clear what it was going to be, the new home of Upper Room Missionary Baptist Church. On January 7, 1976, Upper Room officially had a new sanctuary. But there was a lot of work that needed to be done. When I first came to the church, it was full of debris. Uh, it had a stench. It was um, old mattresses. Um, it, it had been used for a dump, literally. We came into this edifice. And we looked around. At that time, it was a dark, dank, uh, smelly place, a uh, porno movie theater. We couldn't understand what in the world Bishop was thinking. After we got all the chairs scrubbed and cleaned up, the men scrubbed the floor, swept and scrubbed the floor, all, you know, with the debris and stuff all over the floors and stuff. And, and we tried to get stuff that smelled nice to try to get some of that uh, mildew odor and stuff out. But we worked hard because we wanted to, we really wanted to be in church on Sunday. We wanted to just be here, you know. If we, I felt that if we get some of the dirt out, we're cool, we're fine. So that's exactly what happened. <laughs> it was a struggle, but it was a lot of fun. And I say that when I say it was a lot of fun because, of course, I'm, I'm young. And of course, uh, the work that we had to do was we did a lot of, well, the cleaning, that wasn't fun. <laughs> that wasn't fun, the cleaning wasn't fun, but what was actually fun was coming together with the group of people and some of the things that we did, did to, uh, to get the church started, some of the, um, some of the functions that we put on, you know, with car washes, we did that, and uh, we, so chicken dinners, of course it's what they were doing, we were selling chicken dinners upstairs, because we had like three apartments, and so upstairs, uh, where now it's a multi-purpose room, it was actually three apartments, and so they had a couple of kitchens up there, so that was fun doing that, and raising the funds we needed uh, to get, uh, the different things we need to put in the church. On March 28, 1976, Bishop Aiken, First Lady Jane Aiken, and the rest of Upper Room held their first service at Ogons and Topohocken. A true example 
that the building was a gift from God, the church was allowed to hold services for nine months without making a single mortgage payment. It was beautiful. It was wonderful because we knew that the vision was coming to fruition. And we just, we just praised God and thanked him for what he was going to do, what he was doing, and we knew that someday it would be as he would have it to be. The early years of Upper Room saw an unmeasurable level of commitment from the entire church. All were determined to fulfill the mission of building this house of God from the inside and out. It started with its leader, Bishop Aiken, who served without a salary for the first six months and was paid very little for two years after that. They saw him struggling, working, not just asking folks for help, but trying to help as much as he could himself. I think this was an inspiration. Sometimes people ask you, to, people ask you to do something that they're not willing to do themselves. But there's nothing that he asked anybody else to do that he was not willing to do himself. So if it meant wheel balance stuff out of here, he got behind the wheel barrel. If it meant carrying cinder block, he carried in the block, so it wasn't like that he was telling me, you all carried us in the block and I watched y'all carry it. He carried us in the block too. And that was the kind of, I think, the uh, emphasis that kind of, uh, that here we had somebody who was not only willing to, that was going to lead, but also help in the process. I didn't quite understand it in my younger years, or what have you, um, that that in itself um, took up a lot of the time or the hours that I desired to have from him. Um, so it was different in a large respect when I said different, it was different than other children and other, you know, individuals who I see, you know, the father's interaction or what have you. Um, it wasn't until really later uh, that I really identified the need for him to be who he was uh, to so many others um, in the major role that he played in their lives because there were sons and daughters that didn't have a father. All that hard work paid off. Three and a half years after opening the doors, the mortgage was burned after being purchased for $25,000. For those who were part of the original 29 members, it was a labor of love. For one of those individuals, it was something much deeper. Deacon Davenport was, of course, he and Reverend George Aiken Sr., uh, they, they were really tight. Um, they liked each other, and he just told him, you know, make sure you look after my son. And so wherever Jim went, that's where Deacon Davenport went. Deacon Davenport had a front row seat to unbelievable growth at Upper Room. Bishop Bacon's charismatic style of preaching brought a countless number of souls, not just to church, but to Christ. His desire to save souls and make people feel right at home rubbed off on his church family. and It led to Upper Room being called the friendliest church in town. Not only that, the creation of 17 ministries made things clear. Upper Room was more than just a church. When it was an area of growth for me because I was a person, believe it or not, that was afraid to say a word in public or anywhere else. I sat in the corner and I would listen and I'd look around and I would not speak out at all. And Bishop said, you're going to be my church clerk. My knees, my whole body rattled. I said, oh no, you are not talking to me. That will not be the case. He said, yes, you are. And I said, Bishop, I can't even talk to you, let alone talk to people in public. He said, pray and ask God to give you the words to say. Take yourself out the picture and let God. Well, that first Sunday, I said, well, God, you got it. And from that Sunday on, I've been speaking 
at one place or another, or here or there. And I said, if it was not for bishops seeing something in me that I didn't know I had, I would not have been able to progress and do the things that God had in store for me. We were singing over there. I don't remember the song, but we were singing and the Spirit of the Lord touched me. And somehow, I don't remember what had happened to me, but all I know, I, when I realized that I was bouncing up and down, I, I, I felt ashamed because the, the enemy said, look at you, everybody looking at you, and you just showed around. And when I looked around, <laughs> I looked around, I did, but I didn't see nobody looking. And then right then and there I said, oh, you, I rebuked that. The Spirit of the Lord had visited me. Now you want me to feel ashamed of what God has given me. So that was one of my greatest moments because I had never shouted before. And I had asked the Lord, Lord, let me shout like everybody else. Why is it that I don't shout like everybody else? Then you know sometimes when God give you something, then all at once you allow the enemy to steal it from you. So after I realized what had happened to me, I say, oh God, forgive me for allowing the, the enemy to make me think otherwise. And I know that you're a good God, and I'm just happy that your spirit fell on me. In 2011, a titanic shift was about to take place. Due to serious health concerns, Bishop Bacon was forced to retire. His last major decision was to appoint a predecessor. He didn't have to look far to do so. He turned to his youngest son, Reverend Carlton Leon Bacon. He and I never really had a conversation about me picking over anything. No, no, no. <laughs> Let's get that straight. I, I, I want you all to to know that the next pastor of the upper room is in the house. And I don't want nobody to uh, make any mistakes when I'm wrong about fussing and saying, well, who's who going to be? There he is. My approach to my father was um, not to take over at all, actually. It was my approach to my dad was, I had saw some things within the ministry to where is, I felt that I would be of some use, um, that I could lead in a particular manner in which would um, make his load lighter. Um, at the time he was uh, becoming more in a weaker physical state, uh, but spiritually strong. Um, and I just wanted to kind of take some of that burden off of him. Um, and at the time, my words to him was, I'm being underutilized, and I, I really want to um, help in a manner in which I can aid in this manner and aid in this way and that way, what have you. And, it, and it, be, it became some specific areas where he said to me specifically, uh, when it's your time to pastor, that's for you to do. Mm -hmm. But God's not telling me to move in that manner. On April 4th of 2011, a proclamation service was held to formally introduce Reverend Aiken as the new pastor of Upper Room. He was scheduled to be installed in November of that same year. However, God had other plans. Bishop Joseph C. Aiken would not live to see his youngest son take over as leader. He passed away on July 5th, 2011. Carlton knew that probably not not just because of his health, but we really think that Bishop was going to remain pastor of Upper Room until he actually left this earth. And, and that's, that's what he wanted, and that's what we respected that decision. So I don't think any of us had ever thought that he, he would be installed as the pastor of Upper Room before his father actually passed away. 
because we knew that he wanted to be pastor of Upper Room until the very end. Well, I, I think that it was a desire on his part that one of these boys would, would carry that on. Yeah, that is, he kind of had that had that in mind. Talked about it long before it came to pass. I remember um, joking with my dad and telling him, I said, you know what? I said, you know, if you you would want to die right in that pulpit, wouldn't you? Preach it. Mm -hmm. He said, right there, yep. right there, right there. That's exactly where I would want to be. Um, man, oh man. It really, like I said, it. it a lot of um, latter parts of our relationship um, made up for a lot of the missing elements um, in my younger, our younger relationship um, as father and son. Um, and I think grandchildren softened them up. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, more being being more communicative and identifying with with him just like he identified with others and saying that you know hey there may be a flaw but I'm, I'm I see your attributes I see the power in your flaws and what God intended to take place in those flaws and when I began to look through his glass his viewing glass and I started to see him and who God made him what I would give to see those flaws again. After a period of mourning and reflection, it was time to head back to work. On October 1st, 2011, Reverend Carlton Leon Aiken was formally installed as the new pastor of Upper Room Missionary Baptist Church. Both he and his wife, First Lady Brandy Aiken, had a full understanding that the church suffered a monumental loss in the death of their founder, pastor, and more importantly, father. At the same time, they embraced the vision God gave both of them. Those Baptist distinctives that make us unique, what have you, are, are great guidelines, what have you, but if we're not kingdom-minded, um, if we're not building the kingdom for the body of Christ, if we're not teaching death, burial, and resurrection, um, if we're not teaching in the manner in which Jesus taught, you know, where he walked among tax collectors and those that were, again, the downtrodden and those that were uh, the castaways of society, if you will, um, and still have that inept ability to still um, go in and teach in, you know, the, the synagogues and to be able to have that ability to speak to, um, to all walks of life, um, that, that, it, that it came for all that they might have life and have it more abundantly, you know. Um, if we're not teaching in that manner, if we're not driving that message home, um, that we're building the kingdom for the body of Christ, if we're building the kingdom for a particular denomination, we're building the kingdom for a specific pastor or a specific movement or a specific person, if they're building, if people come up a room saying, we're building this and we're doing this for Carlton, you know, you're doing it for the wrong reason, you know. We need to be Christ-centered. We need to have a Christ-like agenda. Um, so the whole drive for building the kingdom for the body of Christ is that, a Christ-centered agenda, um, to be biblically strong, um, but to be relative. Each ministry at the church has one mission, full commitment to building the kingdom for the body of Christ. Furthermore, an additional objective is to grow, work, and compel men and women to come to Christ. For those who have been fortunate to see a son continue what his father started here at Upper Room, it has been a true gift from God. I'm thankful that um, Carlton is there to do the work, to carry that work on um, that God has given him to do. It makes me feel good to know that my son is continuing doing work for the Lord, making a difference in people's lives. Um, that's exciting for me. Um, and, uh, and I know that um, Bishop uh, was a, just as excited or more uh, because he knew the work was gonna be carried on. March 24th, 2012. 
Less than a year after Bishop Aiken's passing, a permanent reminder of his dedication to God and his church was hung on high for all the world to see. The 2000 block of East Tuppelhocken Street was renamed Joseph C. Aiken Way in memory of a man who was committed to a life of great work. He took that in the community, which the community was, was so upset about having this movie theater here, mm -hmm. and he did something wonderful for the community. So when the state representatives and, and everybody came together and the mayor and everything came and said, we want to change that because he did so much on this corner, that was just like, wow. You know, because people get their names put on the street because of political reasons and because they have money or, or whatever they did, but not necessarily from a religious standpoint for that to be done. So that was just amazing. When we're gone and can't tell this story and we don't have any cameras in front of us or, and it's no longer Carlton Aiken sitting here telling you the story, if there's any physical sign, it's nothing like having that marker outside the front. My father really wasn't one, he even said it before, like don't raise no monuments and different things in my name and don't do this and that, that's not what it's about. And I understand that that's ultimately not what it's about. But it's so nice for others to, to think it not robbery, to say, hey, your father meant this much to us to where we're willing to go beyond what the normal thing is because that's what he did. He went beyond what was normal and did something that was different, difficult, challenging, um, but something special. The work now continues under the direction of the son of the bishop. Just like his father before him, Reverend Aiken has established new ministries ranging from culinary to building beautification to two fish, five loaves. The future looks bright for Upper Room Missionary Baptist Church. New members continue to join a plan to modify the entire church to better serve its community and congregation is in place. And the work that started 40 years ago continues. My um, vision and thought for it, what it would be the church that God would, uh, is calling for in these days and times, because it's about uh, the people. It's about gathering the people, because God is going to come back one day. That is true. And so we have to be ready. So what I would like to see is knowing that, um, that my son, Pastor Carlton, is on that mark and being focused and doing the work that God has called him to do, to bring the people in uh, and uh, just be a great ministry in the neighborhood. I'm just excited about where God has brought us from because when I think about what it looked like and what we have now, it's just such a blessing, such a blessing. And to see how faith has brought us this far. And I know faith with the, this first 40, I know faith will continue to keep us for the next 40. I may not be here to see it, but I'm sure that it will carry on. There's just one difference. Upper Room Missionary Baptist Church doesn't sit on the corner of Ogons and Tuppelhocken anymore. It sits on the corner of Ogons and Joseph C. Aiken Way. Yeah.